Tata Bhagavato Arato Sama Samudasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arato Sama Samudasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arato Sama Samudasa Homage to him, the Holy One, the, man, the wise one, the fully enlightened one. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. I don't know why I can't get those three things straight. That's got to be burned into my head. I can do it fine when I'm in a temple. And every time I do it here, it's really funny. These three little things. Amachim, the Holy One. And the what's the middle one? The middle one is some women. I have, usually have it sitting right here. The second one? Yeah. What is the second one? I don't know what's wrong with me. <laughs> It's really strange. Um, let's see. I don't have any light. I've got to turn the light on. Blessed one, worthy one, fully enlightened one. He's worthy. I know he's worthy. He's signed, he's worthy, he's educated, he's wise. <laughs> So it's like the blessed one, the worthy one, the fully enlightened one. You, you'd think I could do that, but I wrote all these things about it and everything. And now it's really strange <laughs> because I'm not at a regular temple. I'm not going down every day. Oh, look, I have a, I have a holy orb. Just a second. I have to get rid of the spaceship. Um, no, there, gone. It's just the Klingons, they, they forgot to put their cloaking device on, I guess. <laughs> See, I got that one, okay. Okay, so what's happened is probably for the last five days, almost every day, I have had people either write me about a holiday uh, piece and I decided to do it now, but it, this is something that's not just for Christmas. This is something uh, that I used to do every year for anybody in any religion celebrating any kind of holiday. It doesn't matter. Any extended holiday where the relatives, they show up. Yep, they show up and they come to see you. And in the United States, there's a lot of conflict because it's a very mobile society. There's the East and the West and the North and the South and everybody lives far, far away. Even like when I'm at home and I'm in Missouri, my children are 1600 miles one direction, 1400 miles another direction and about 1700 another direction. So I don't get to see them very often. So we, if we were coming together, I, I would just sit there and smile through the whole thing now. But in the old days when you're not Buddhist and you don't have the inside track very well uh, on how things work with all your relatives. And you know, Aunt Sue, she shows up at your house and she's gonna tell you and your husband how everything works and how you should live your life. And you haven't seen Aunt Sue for maybe 12 months or a year or more. And there they come, they're gonna to wanna to tell you how to live, what to do, and they're really trying to be kind. They really love you, you're the relative. They wanna help you out. And sometimes it doesn't go over well with your husband or your wife, and it causes a lot of conflict. So um, some people get very upset, they end up having more arguing going on than celebration. That's what happens. And so how do we deal with this? What do we do? So I started thinking how to do this. And then I found a lovely piece. A small sutta is at the end of this. I'm going to read this to you first. And then I'm going to do the sutta at the end because this little sutta tells us a lot about what we should be doing, how, how you should be handling this. And it's, it's an extension, in a way, the sutta is an extension of other ideas, like whatever I, I do for you, that's what I get back, or what you put out, you get back. If you're kind, people are kind to you. If you have loving kindness and you use compassion, hopefully you can expect that's going to be happening. And you don't go out in the world when you're 
living with loving kindness and compassion and joy and equanimity, you, if you keep thinking about that all day long, you don't go out in the world and look for trouble. So you don't walk into situations with a negative attitude assuming that whatever is said to you is being said at you. You don't do that. So let's see what we came up with. Um, this was actually a piece that was a few years ago. Um, it was some, um, oh, you look at this, it's not open anymore. <laughs> it's really funny. So let me go find it for a minute. Mm, there we go, there it is, okay. And I'm just gonna go through it. And then uh, I promise there's not many story offshoots on this <laughs> either, there's not, okay. So the, the principle of this is that protecting oneself, one protects others. Protecting others, one protects yourself. So a lesson, this is a lesson to take in to prepare for family visits during any holiday season. I really don't care if it's Diwali or it's Ganesha's birthday or it's the Jewish Hanukkah. I don't care when everybody's around. Listen carefully, because when I woke up this morning and I pondered, why couldn't people just try something for one day that might bring some change into this world? Have you ever thought about that? I mean, when you recognize anything happening during your life today, stop a moment. Do you do that? Check whether you are taking it very personally before you respond, or are you mentally preparing to act, react back with the same force that you received from the encounter, whatever was said to you? Watch more closely and tell me, what are you thinking? Before you act, question yourself. Am I taking this too personally? Because that's the heart of the matter. Am I taking it immediately as offensive and falling directly into the defensive? Did I get caught in the drama that was going on in the room? Like one of my students came downstairs and everybody was a mess in the house and she'd been upstairs meditating as she walked into like a thunderstorm, you know? Did I, uh, or did I remember to step back from it in my mind and just listen and watch with some equanimity? Are you checking your mind to see how your intention will answer what is essentially going on in each interaction that you are part of or you take part in during the day? Do your actions align with your knowledge of how mind works? Do you really believe there is hope in this world to change this world or not? It's really time to question this with everything going on. This is what's been going through all these people's minds. They see things happening crazy in a lot of different governments right now. They see things going crazy with COVID and whatever going on. In your life, you ever ask yourself how it would change things if I just forgive what's really happening before making any response at all and not judge it. This is what we have to practice. And did I react too quickly without considering forgiveness at all? Did I question myself? The question is why not forgive? And people say all the time to me when I say forgive, they say, why should I forgive them? Look what they said. But the question here is why not forgive and take a moment and pause before you respond? I'm only asking you to forgive in your mind. I want you to understand that if you do that, you will feel different because you will be taking care of yourself and not holding in what happened. Has this maybe been missing? Which you, when you forgive, your mind feels immediately lighter. That's the feeling of forgiveness. You don't go into forgiveness meditation and try to bring up a feeling to forgive. We have to be really clear about this. You go into forgiveness meditation with the intention to forgive. And then when it starts working, you begin to feel what it's like 
to forgive someone else and let go of something or have someone forgive you. And even if you don't smile outside, you do naturally smile a moment inside when you forgive someone or they forgive you. Truthfully, you do, even if you don't realize it for yourself. Now, when you come back to your task, add in just a pinch of compassion, a little loving kindness and a smile to experience an ounce of uplifted joy. It's like making Christmas cookies. <laughs> it's just like making Christmas cookies. Put in what the flavor is that you want to have when it comes back. Why? Q is asking me why. <laughs> Everybody is saying, why? Why should I do that? Ah, there you go again. The question is, why not forgive? Giving space and good wishes to others in your heart takes your mind off your own worries and lightens up both your heart and your mind. In most cases, over big holidays or celebrations, folks don't come by for a very long visit. It's usually for one or two days at the most, and then they return home. And back home, what that means is they go hundreds of miles back home. They're not going to come every day to see you, you know? The advice here is to decide in advance to welcome them and not to lose your energy getting involved in unessential memories from past times, but only happy times. And if you are caught on the negative, accept the possibility first that change is possible and that changing subjects that are going downhill is not a bad idea. So this is about preparing to do just that, sub suggesting a more upward trend for your mind. You have some hope and you start not just talking about hope, you start living a little bit of hope. What you think and ponder on becomes the inclination of your mind. You're mid too, <laughs> but your mind, okay. Um, you can use that to reshape what is coming to your door when faraway relatives come once a year to drop in for the holidays. So truth is that you can prepare for it by determining that you will set the scene. You set the energy in the room, the tone for the time that they arrive. So don't lose your energy to the other side as you do this. It's very smart to protect your mind, protect your heart. And the moment that you do that, you are protecting the other person too. This is the trick to this whole thing. Prepare subject rerouting in advance. It's like a computer terminal or some kind of electronic something or a game. Prepare that if something, if somebody shoots, you give them a hug <laughs> or you give them a cookie or you give them a glass of punch. This is what I'm talking about. Prepare the subject rerouting in advance. If say something negative comes to you, when you hear the negative, answer with a positive changing the bait completely. They baited you, but you counter bait. When you hear a negative answer with a positive, changing the situation, you are now in control. Welcome. The fact is that the moment that you give up your view and agree to support the other person's downhill direction, in that moment, you have opened yourself to a downward turn. You have given in to no hope of the fact that the whole idea should be given up about changing the future of this world. That's how far this goes inside you. You do this with your family, then you do it with your friends, then you do it at work, then you do it at church, then you do it at outdoor meetings, and all of a sudden you do it with your attitude towards the world. You don't believe it can really change. So don't give in. Keep an eye on the upward trend and keep leading into subjects that you can move upward for everyone. You have a set of them. If you're a family, you give each child in the room something they can say when they hear the negative come up. You can start asking them if the person's dog is still as big as it was, or how's your pet rabbit? What's that? Or how are your kids doing in school? How's your son doing in college? Counter the conversation. Let them brag back to you. This is the most important part of this. 
from the moment of their entry, remember that you have the power. You've got the power. Oh yeah, you got the power. Oh my, you got the power. Do you remember that song? You've got the power. You've got the power. When they come to visit you, you've got the power. And you truly can change the whole event because you have both knowledge that we've taught you and you have hope and you understand how stuff works. So therefore, this is the year that you can change your act when visitors come in for the holidays. Staying positive. You are really offering hope for others to latch onto your bright energy. If you stand fast and refuse entry of negative downward dialogues and you competitive jargons into subjects that you don't know anything about, just turn it around and say, you know, I got a new lawnmower. <laughs> Or else you say, you know, there's a new, a new kind of car. Did you hear about it? It runs on water. Go anywhere you want. That's really fantastic. If you don't have any place to go, there, you look up on the internet. You go and there's a place. This is really great. You go to a place where you can only hear positive news. You try to find it on YouTube. There's a whole big news system. And all they do is talk about uplifting and hopeful and great stuff that's going on try it for a while, change your mind. So here's an approach suggestion, put forgiveness into everything you do. And they say or do before even they even come into your doorway. Keep smiling all day long, travel through your day working through one task at a time accurately and efficiently within each present time space until the tasks are done, you keep smiling. Whatever you're doing, wherever you are, this is how to feel a little bit better, right? Right now. Stay in the present time car, the one that I showed you on the pet, you know, the birth and the death and you're in the present time car, stay in your car and don't drive in the direction of the past old events gone by or get locked uh, during this special day, giving energy away to the unconstructed future either. Don't do that. Don't sit there and start. Everybody's worried about COVID. This is when you have an opportunity for everybody to come together, don't sit down, and just talk about COVID. And, and you know, it must be a lie or it isn't real or why don't we wear our masks? And it's just a song. do something else. Decide ahead of time. We're not gonna talk about COVID. We're not gonna talk about the governments. We're just gonna talk about what we remember that's fun and we like each other and have some fun, fun. Has it ever occurred to you that all of us want life to be different, more gentle, patient, sharing, caring, and balanced for the entire species of human beings all over the globe? Because that's a fact right now. Everybody's looking for it. Did it ever occur to you that the world you wish for is inside you already? This is the one that's really kind of neat. It's right there. It's in my head. It's in Dhamma Gavesi's heart and his head. It's in my head. It's in Su Huang's head. It's in everybody's head right now. Wow. One does not have to wait for a new world to happen. We can begin one right now. That's what the sign should say. That's what they should be learning in Sunday school. That's what everybody should be thinking about. Why worry about how the world is? Instead, we just have to decide to bring that world out of our heart and into being right now. Into being right now. That's it. I'm not kidding about this. This is kind of a weird thing human beings do. They all sit around and if it's real quiet, sometime you'll hear about this great world they have inside them. But then they never actually believe that they could actually have it. They don't go one step further to realize they could make it happen tomorrow in their house, in their family, in their church or their temple and in their community. Right now, there's no reason to wait for this. All of us beings have talked about this a lot in a lot of places over the years. We do it in the coffee shop, in the office break kitchen. We do it at school, at the gym, in political circles, at meetings, haven't we? We humans have probably heard this before, but what if we just did it? Wow, what a shock. That is my children's question. Why don't we really send out kind thoughts to all beings in all directions all the time in our life? 
rather than for a few days here and there through our life. Why do we do that? What if when you were driving, typing, washing, building, planning, singing, studying, walking, digging a garden, giving a speech, could you work this into there what, with whatever you're doing? <laughs> you gotta laugh at it. At the, at the most, you gotta laugh at how miserable some of the jobs are we have to do in the world. And then you just remember a Nietzsche and it's enough to make you smile because you know, you know, even if you don't like what you're doing, I had a messy job today. Oh, but I knew there was an end. And even at the worst part, <laughs> this bucket I had was too small and that mop kept getting really dirty water. It was horrible. And I cleaned the floor and looked around. It was smearing more dirt on the floor. I needed four buckets to clean the dirt. It was silly, but I knew something. I knew something Sister Kama told me. Oh my gosh, I knew something. She said, Anicha, Anicha, <laughs> that was it. But how can this be, says Q, how can we make it happen? Oh, come on, Nike said it clearly. Nike knew what was going on. Everybody knows about Nike shoes. Just do it. Silly not to do that is an ad, isn't it? It's silly, they don't take that and change. Just do it, just do it for the world. Just do it. Don't talk about it anymore. We've had enough talk. Whenever something feels like it is coming to you, will you let go of that thought of me just for a minute? What if the other guy or gal is having a bad time and life is getting just way too hard for them? What if you don't know this and you get mad, get mad in their face because they got mad at you, but can't you see this? Can you sense it? Can't you sense it? You watch people more closely. And Q says, well, what would forgive them, giving them change anything? Okay, then. What if you forgave them and then you just listened over a cup of hot chocolate or tea? Would it kill you to do that? If you knew what was going on in their life, would you be a little bit tamer? Would you have been a little bit more kinder in your response? After the steam settles, what would happen if you forgive the whole thing in your mind and you too just took a walk to get some coffee, some tea, or definitely ice cream, and you just listened to each other for equal time across a table in a, in a coffee shop, taking turns until you begin to really hear, hear what's happening beyond the sounds of me, 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 my part, me, 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 mine, oh, wow, me, me, <laughs> and my part of it, that's crying out in your head, trying to get ready to speak when you just needed to listen. What if that feeling keeps pushing up in my head, like everything is just coming at me today, and it's just as heavy feeling totally due to how I look at things. Was it just because of my perspective I reacted in that way? Yeah, it is, yeah. Can you change your perspective? Does how I choose to see the world make a difference? What if I could change my perspective for a time in the holidays while people are visiting just that long? Could you do that? That's not asking too much. One, two, three days maximum usually. And Q says, well, I, I could do that. I, I, I could, I could. But how can I forgive something when it bothers me, KK? How, how, how much, so much, how can I do that? Look at the reality of it. It was last year that happened. It was three years back the person said that or whatever it was that happened. Why give the past any energy for today's celebration? Why not stay here in the celebration? Why not see it? Why not decide to change something? Oh, I see, says Q. Yes, well, just do it, Q, and find out how it feels. That's the only way I can explain it to you. You can try it by telling your mind, I will just temporarily change your view and I won't let anybody talk me out of this. Tell your mind, I'm, good, I'm, not, I'm just gonna change my view for today, so don't get upset with me, mind. 
because all of this is a lesson about communication with your mind. Be different for a few days and just see what it's like. And then, then continue on. You see, this is the way a human being is constructed. The moment you forgive, you will feel a bit lighter. See, the problem isn't me or you, that's not it. It's just about how we grew up taking stuff so personally. It's about how we immediately become defensive and how this causes a kind of inner confusion. This is happening because of our con unconscious adoption of a false idea that everything going on is happening to us. When I agree with this concept, then whatever happens is it must be mine and I must keep it with me and believe me, it can get very, very heavy. And if it is mine, it must be part of myself right here then with me in everything I do. Oh boy, here we go. <laughs> if it's always about me, then it's so personal, I must defend me. And I would like myself, I won't like myself in the morning. And then you feel bad in the morning. But, but if you affirm, if I affirm in my mind that there can be an opposite point of view, then without taking everything so personally, I can let go, relax, smile, <laughs> come to the table here. And now I could begin living with a bit more selflessness. I can affirm this to myself and family and take an oath to keep it going for an entire holiday visit. Then I wouldn't have to get on the defensive at all. I can do that. And things could be very light and very happy. Can tell my mind that I do have the power of choice right now. I can change to pursuing unselfish thoughts, words, actions, like giving out candy. <laughs> I can give out free forgiveness and offer loving kindness and helping hand with those in need. Hmm, maybe I can, not bad. Okay, maybe when something is happening, it is just happening as it is. And it's not about me. It isn't mine. And it's not myself either. Maybe it's just as it is occurring and then it will pass away. And it's that true, if that is true, in that case, then if I begin thinking this way more often, if I ponder this in my mind, my inclination of mind will begin to bend in that direction. I know I will feel happier about life and not be stressed and worried about the future so much or depressed about the path if I just pursue this angle. So Q says, if something happens and I have to talk it over with another person, I might need to have a plan. Some of us don't have any idea how to listen. Well, a lot of us were never listened to when we grew up. So we had a bad example, but taking things over, talking things over sounds like a good idea to get more ideas how to decide. Nice. Okay, okay, here's a plan, Q. What if you just ask the other person what's going well right now when they arrive? I could encourage them to talk and pay them compliments. And after a while, I could ask them what's been difficult for them in their life right now. And if they share a little bit of that with me, then I could ask them what's their plan is to get through the hard stuff right now. I could say, so what's your plan to handle that? And the people like to be able to help another person sometimes. This is really true. So I might ask them, how can I support you? By listening to them, by physically cleaning up a location for you. Is that possible? Can I help you that way? Perhaps I can help you by listening to your plan to reach the successful solution you want to try. Well, maybe I could help with some transportation. Whatever you feel that you could offer, that's a start. Then maybe they could listen to me 
by asking the same questions to me, wouldn't that be different? But hey, I look at it this way. Um, that would be sharing time, wouldn't it? And, and if I want to change the world to be a better world, I would need to be willing to try new things. So why not start there? If only one of us were willing to change our perspective to a more impersonal one, even that would give hope for others to see more clearly that we can live our highest dreams too. And then all of us could discover that we have the power to change the way that we see things. And that would be the way we dreamed of. That could begin right here, right now, in this house, this Christmas, this New Year celebration. Wow, it's something to be considered. You could be here right now. Pretty soon, all would know one thing for sure, too. Nothing is happening to us. And this is what we know as Buddhists. Nothing is happening to us. Everything is happening from us. Once we see this, we have gained hope for real change in the world. So the hope I am talking about here is based on your personal power to change your perspective so that you will make different decisions for actions instead of continuous reaction. And if we continue to believe that everything is happening to us and we continue to react, then we'll lose. We're going to lose not only ourselves, but also we're going to go to war and we're going to lose our world. It's simple. But if we choose to believe that everything is happening from us, then we will lose all our doubt and begin to pause and respond in balance with nature for the good of ourselves and make peace with others in the world. Perhaps we will begin to move more firmly in the direction of peaceful coexistence throughout our world. And if more of us would put our knowledge and dreams into action today, this could happen. It really could. This is why it is of great value to study how things actually work in our lives. In this world, in line with modern neurocognitive science research that has confirmed that people truly need to learn from the inside out how human beings actually operate so that we can end any ideas about war being worth it ever anymore. I encourage you for Christmas, for your holiday, for whatever season you celebrate, you should test out the knowledge that we're discussing here, apply it to your own life during the holiday season or any periodic celebration that you might attend together as a family group. All of us can try something new for one week long. I know you can. I'm sure of it. Try this out. Just forgive. So it is for yourself and others. Just forgive and begin to see for yourself how it feels and what happens next. Because practicing forgiveness, compassion, and loving kindness towards ourself and all others will bring immediate relief and affect the people around you because they will feel a happier and more positive energy. It will begin surrounding all of us too. This sort of reasoning and testing will make everything a bit lighter in life and bring more balance into our lives because this is a kind of hope, it's a positive change and it can move forward to what we all probably dream about for our planet, a firmer peace in the world. In closing, I'll give you just one little short story. And this one was preserved in the suttas for you, which can be applied to the talk that I just gave you here as well. This one gives you the gist of the whole lesson above which is just like my teacher, because you know, if I wrote four or five pages, he would hand it to me in one paragraph, but <laughs> he is the master teacher and he can write short, much shorter than me. So listen carefully. This comes from the, uh, the Kanda, Kanda Samyutta Nikaya. 
and it's in book number 47 in it should say SN there, <laughs> the, the SN, it's, um, and it is 19, yeah, 199. On one occasion, the Blessed One was dwelling among the subhas, some, I, I'm not, sambahas, where there was a town of the sambahas named Sadaka. There the blessed one addressed the monks thus, monks, once in the past, an acrobat set up his bamboo pole and addressed his apprentice, Medakathalika, thus, Come, dear Medakathalika, climb the bamboo pole and stand on my shoulders. Having replied, yes, teacher, the apprentice Medakathalika, he climbed up the bamboo pole and he stood on his teacher's shoulders. The acrobat then said to the apprentice, Medakathalika, you protect me, dear Medakathalika, and I'll protect you. Thus guarded by one another, protected by one another, we'll display our skills, collect our fee, and we'll get down safely from the bamboo pole. When this was said, the apprentice Medakathalika, he replied, that's not the way to do it, teacher. You protect yourself, teacher, and I'll protect myself. Thus, each self-guarded and self-protected will display our skills, collect our fee, and get down safely from the bamboo pole. That's the method there, the Blessed One said. It's just as the apprentice, Madakathalika, said to his teacher, I will protect myself, monks. Thus, should the establishments of mindfulness be practiced to protect ourselves. I will protect others, monks. Thus should the establishment of mindfulness be practiced in that way, protecting oneself, monks. One protects others, protecting others. One protects one's self. It's very logical. And how is it monks that protecting oneself one protects the others by the pursuit, development, and the cultivation of the four establishments of mindfulness. It is in such a way that by protecting oneself, one protects others. And how is it, monks, that by protecting others, one protects oneself? By patience, harmlessness, loving kindness, sympathy. It is in such a way by protecting others, one protects oneself. I will protect myself, monks. Thus should the establishments of mindfulness be practiced. I will protect others, monks. Thus should the establishment of mindfulness be practiced. Protecting oneself, monks, one protects oneself. So protecting oneself, one protects others, protecting others, one protects self is the gist of this whole lesson. When we look at how he's giving the instructions in the bottom to do this, when you look at the pursuit of development and cultivation of the four establishments of mindfulness with body, feeling, thought, mind, and dhammas, you're learning how everything works and how it all operates. By doing that, you reach a state of equanimity and balance no one else has around you. But you need to set yourself up to do that and remember the setup for it. By understanding whatever is arising through your mindfulness, whether it's in the body or the feeling or the mind, thoughts arising and the Dhamma, it doesn't matter. When you're watching these things and you understand how they operate completely, you have an edge. One boy who was a teenager came up to me once in a talk and he said, 
he's 15 years old and I'm not, I don't know how to be proud of being a Buddhist. He wasn't getting the training he needed. He wasn't getting the gist of it. If you understand how everything works, you come out with a superior set of knowledge and wisdom no one else has out there. When other people are running around, we say running around with their heads like cut off like a chick, chicken runs around, you cut their head off, they run around without their head. People look like that, they behave like that right now. We shouldn't need to behave like that. We should be able to stop and look and see clearly what is happening in every incident, every interaction that we take part in. We should be able to see how things are working clearly. We should be able to see where we're caught and not come down on ourselves, but laugh at the fact that we've been caught and turn around and go and get another bucket so that you can get this floor clean. You know, instead of getting frustrated about one bucket not being the right size, just go get more buckets <laughs> and keep cleaning. It's going to be done. It wasn't hard. It looked like it was so easy. The point is he's giving you specific instructions for your patience, your harmlessness, agreement with your precepts, your loving kindness, which is canceling out your lust and greed, your uh, ill will, I'm sorry, thoughts about ill will, hatred and ill will, and sympathy, feeling, being careful with people and, and sensing something's wrong with everybody right now. And the reason it, the, it's very simple, the cause of the suffering that's happening in everybody systematically right now is called lockdown. <laughs> that's what it is. And it's pretty universal. And people, you know, when I'm sitting here and people get in touch with me, sometimes they get in touch with me from Africa. They get in touch with me from France, from Italy. They call me from all over the world and they talk to me about the same problem, the same drama. It doesn't matter if they're rich or poor or living in a hut or a palace. They have the same problem. They are facing lockdown. And all of a sudden, simple things aren't simple anymore. Many people over here, even in, uh, even in most of the groups, if you're married, you have a house and a few children, a couple children, you de most of the time there's someone there helping you and sometimes a cook around the house or another relative there cooking. But now everybody went home. Now you think that's not a big deal, <laughs> but then I started learning about why it's a big deal. The men are calling me, you know, <laughs> this is women's work. I don't want to do women's work. The women do that work. And now there's only the mother left and she had a maid, she had a cook. She may have had somebody who helped in the gardening. Now the men come, the men, you know, why isn't the garden looking good? Why isn't the walk clean? Why isn't this done and that done? And then they ask the husband or the, the men, the young men or uh, to do something and they have to stop and think, wait a second, my whole life I was told this is women's work. We need to get over that right now. We're in a world crisis for survival. I think we need to get over that. I think they should all pretend something like we're all on a camp out and everybody gets to help with the work, <laughs> something like that. I'm not sure, but that's what they need. So anyway, this is a really good lesson. Let me come back to you all and um, ask, you know, see if you have questions. Can you relate to this? Can you relate to this problem? Because I mean, this is something that's really uh, pretty clear. It's a, it's a lesson on about using, thinking, thinking the questions for yourself and deciding to use what you're learning and applying it. That's what it's really all about, you see? It has to happen in industry. It has to happen in shopping. It has to happen in the malls. It has to happen in the schools. It has to happen everywhere, you see? If you could have been in Goa with me, you would have really understood because that town within a couple of weeks went from a, a fat town to a skeleton. Why? Because the whole structure of a resort community in India is based on immigrant population working in restaurants and hotels and everywhere. And they just disappeared. They just left. And there was this big black 
void. <laughs> you know, and I was in a place called uh, the river. I can never remember. It's the Riviera. It's a resort thing. And it's for 400 families. And there's 12 people living there. 12 people living there and a, a few of us. And that was it. Nobody was there. You know, we're, I'm a, we're allowed to swim, but we don't really usually get a chance to swim. You know, if you're monks in the old temples, they had places where the monks went and they swam and they took baths and they exercised. So I went to this place thinking, nobody's gonna be there. I'll be there by myself and I'll get to swim every day and work out. There's a gym and it had nice equipment. Well, I got there and the truth of the matter hit me. The day after I got there, they drained the pool. I watched them do it from my porch. <laughs> they emptied the pool and took the opportunity to scrub the pool and clean it and then put ropes around it. And then they filled it up with water again. So it didn't, you know, I guess dry out in the sun, but nobody could touch it. Nobody could do it. At first we could sit beside the pool and then they decided we're going to take the chairs away. <laughs> you know, so I kept laughing about this, but and taking Bonte, I couldn't take him out in a wheelchair, but the inside of the building had an elevator and to go push him around the floors and walk around the floors, pushing him and get in the elevator and go up another floor and another floor and down and down and go back to the apartment. We did that a few times, but he didn't really, he didn't like it that much, but, but I'm pushing and pushing, and push, but you can walk in nighttime. Nobody will bother you in the hallways. It was all well lit and guarded community, but the whole idea fell apart because there was so much restriction and it's best you stay inside. And you know, Bonte and I have a condition, a rare condition. <laughs> Dr. Farrell's cracking up. <laughs> we have a very strange condition. We're old. What are you gonna do? <laughs> and you're only as old as you tell your mind. And the strange thing about this whole experience was that we never bothered to tell our mind that we were getting old. We never, we never did that, you know? And for years, we never did it. I started when I was 50 and now I'm 71 and we never told each other, hey, you know, we're getting old. We never said that because we were so busy. We were so busy working and teaching and doing stuff. Nobody said, you're old. I used to say, let's get a new tractor. Let's get some more equipment. <laughs> we never said we were old. We're having too much fun. But the problem is the moment that doctor and that woman stood there and I kept saying, what condition do we have? Why do you want to send us to a hospital? And finally she said, well, and she's looking at the chart and she's looking at us and looking at the chart. It's like, how am I going to tell you this? It was like I was thinking she found out something we didn't know about. And the second she's going to tell me we have a terminal disease and we're going to die in 10 minutes. And she just looked over the chart and she said, well, uh, you see, uh, you're old. And my teacher sitting in that chair was this high. And all of a sudden he slumped, sat silent, dismayed with shoulders drooping and head down glum without response he shrank at least five or ten inches down in the wheelchair <laughs> you know he was fine about it but it was just they made us sit there while everybody else got off the plane and then they told us the news i'm old now see i can't get that <laughs> I just came from the mountain and I just finished jumping off uh, the tower with a hang glider. And now you're telling me I'm old. It doesn't make any sense. <laughs> so how does this affect you? I want to hear from you. Can you do this? Can you do it? Can you do it for a period of a week? It doesn't matter if you have a holiday. You see? It's not that you're a cheery bear that you need to run around cheering everybody up, but what happens if you do live your life and you make a decision, the world has already changed. See, 
you'd be surprised. Somebody is getting ready to get really mad at you when you see them out the corner of your eye and you go, hi, how are you doing? And then they can't get mad at you if you're just smiling and you're, you're throwing off this energy to them. There's no way they can yell at you. No way they can pick on you. It's honestly true. If they do pick on you and say, well, I, uh, you know, I was on my way to get ice cream. You want to come? <laughs> Let's go get something, uh, you know, some tea or something. Give them, I don't know what to tell you, but this stuff really, really works. But nobody will believe me unless you actually try to use it. Because that's what has to happen. So how is it going? Tell me. Hello. Hi. Is it hot down there in Costa Rica? Yes, it's nice and warm. Oh. <laughs> nice and warm and tropical. Nice and warm and tropical. <laughs> <laughs> it's nice and warm. This he just went from New York to his family in Costa Rica. So how so, what's the uh, temperature? Say that again. Temperature. How hot? Oh, the temperature. Oh, it's probably uh, in Celsius, about 22 degrees is very nice. Oh, that's really nice. <laughs> now I'm, I'm hot. We're a little bit hotter than that here. Okay. Yeah. That's good news. You're lucky. So how's so it going? I wanted, good, good. I just wanted to comment on, uh, on what you've been saying. And I was thinking when I, when I came down here about a week ago, I was thinking, cause you know, I, I'm, I've been listening to you. I've been practicing all this and I'm, would wonder, you know, how do I share my Buddhism with my family? <laughs> and then um, it really dawned on me after a few days that it was the easiest way was to um, just being it rather than talking about it. That you That's know, rather, right. Yeah, just being because, it. Because, you know, honestly, Ulysses, you don't need to share your Buddhism. You can mm -hmm. share your Catholicism in a new light. Mm -hmm. You can. Correct. Correct. Yeah. It's not it's not far away very much at all if you go through the New Testament mm -hmm. and you come back to the uh, Buddhist texts, it's pretty identical. And, and, it, and it was it was it, you know this this whole thing about you know keeping the smile going at all times, you know understanding that everything is an each um, and um, you you said a couple of things in here that I wrote down. You said. Nothing is happening to us. Everything is happening from us. That was really a wonderful phrase that I will never forget because uh, this is what always happens, that we always think that everything is happening to us when in reality we are actually always creating what is happening to us. So... Um, ding, um, ding, 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 ding. You just a won lot me ding, ding. Yeah. A lot of ding, ding. <laughs> Yeah, and so I get these questions like, how come you're always smiling? Or it's you like, oh, this is what I practice now. I practice smiling. <laughs> sure, I mean, why not? Who do you, let me ask you, the, the trick question is this. Let me ask you, do you remember when your father sat you down in your life and told you now you're this old and you don't smile anymore, and you're not supposed to have wonderment in your life anymore. Wonderment is like where you're going, and everything is just wonder. It's just like a child. You see, you're, do you remember, do any of you remember your parents taking you aside and giving you this instruction? You're not allowed to take your shoes off and put them, walk on the beach by the ocean anymore. You're not allowed to play. You are not allowed to fool around with compassion for yourself. You are supposed to work now. Work. I can't find anybody who can tell me they had that conversation. And yet if we walk around 5,000 people in a park, how many people are actually smiling and actually coming because somebody said they had to go? <laughs> you know? Why aren't they smiling? Why aren't they playing? What's wrong with this picture? You see, you have to reevaluate how old you are. Right now, I'm eight years old. You know why? I'm 71 and seven plus one is eight. And uh -uh, I'm eight years old. That's it. You see, that's how it works.
So you take the two digits and put them together. That's how old you are. Then figure out if that child at eight years old, they're pretty fun. Even eight year olds is not bad. You know, uh, I'm not looking forward to being nine again. <laughs> C5. Oh, look, you got five years old and he's in Costa Rica. That is golden. You have got to go tomorrow to the beach with a bucket, get some sand and another bucket with water. And you make drip castles and you see how high they can get and find some kid on the beach, you know, near his parents, since they can see you doing this, you know, and, and sit down and just drip, make drip castles and see how high you can get them. <laughs> five-year-old between three to five years old drip castle city man and you build and build a sand castle your favorite fort in history or your favorite castle try to build it in the sand <laughs> you see do you have do you have reservations about this i mean is something holding you back think about what is it who told you that you see when i was 50 that was the end it wasn't, I wasn't totally involved with Bhante V. Ramsey yet. That's not it. Okay, it's not the Buddhism. But at 50, I had had enough of the lack of cooperation, everybody arguing, everybody fighting, nobody making progress in a lot of things in the community, the city, the country, everything. It was like bongers. And I decided, you know, a good affirmation would be, I promise I will never die. <laughs> I will not grow old. <laughs> and I'm going to have more fun than ever. And then I translated that. And that means after 50, don't do it unless it's fun. And there are lots of ways to make things fun. Don't do it anymore unless it is fun. So I expect some jazz in that cathedral when I get back. <laughs> there was a Mozart, a jazz piece about Mozart. You need to get a hold of that and do that one. <laughs> Acapella. <laughs> Sister Gemma, uh, are we going to do the Sutta, Sutta uh, the uh, end of the uh, document which you had shared? You had given the Sutta. We just did it. Did you go someplace? Because we just finished it. Okay. We did it. Oh, okay. We did it. Yeah, we did. Uh, <laughs> that's, what, that's, that's, what, that's why I came out here, you know, because to see what's going on. See, the question is, who told you that you couldn't have fun in life? You know, all the things, you know, you say, but this is so sad. We can sit here and we can get miserable if you want. Let's look at Yemen. We'll start with Yemen. It's miserable in Yemen. A lot of people are going to die in Yemen. It's true. This is a big glow. And you, you know, you can start talking about Yemen and the Sahara, and they're going to have a terrible, terrible time. It's true. But where are you and what can you do? You can say you're prayers at night and send loving kindness in that direction. And you can send as much energy into the world as possible. But don't you dare wear yourself out crying on the floor when you're in New York and you're not in Africa right now. It doesn't work. It doesn't do anything. You need to keep your head clear. And if you want to work on something that has to do with change for it, we want you there healthy, awake, strong, ready with a clear mind to come up and allow ideas to come up. That's what you need for any organization that's working with that. Yeah, there's going to be a rough year next year. But whatever it is, we're human beings. And the one thing we are resilient about is we can help each other. And when you're working to help one person, you're letting go of your own stuff. This is something to remember. That's also what this lesson is about. When I protect me, I protect you. Wear your mask, whether you like it or not. They hear about, this is like, they should have a sign on the wall for these masks. Don't tell them where it came from, Perel. But if I protect me, I protect you. And when you protect yourself, you protect me. 
And they told us some things. The doctor said, we wear the masks if we have it and we don't want to give it to someone else. See? So when I went the other day to lunch with the abbot, I don't want to go out anymore with him to lunch. We're in a small room with 30 people with no masks. And they're all huddled together, shoulder to shoulder in a tiny little living room. I wanted to get up and walk out. I kept my mask on. I took it down. And then when somebody coughed, I started feeding myself under the mask. <laughs> you know, it's really a tough call. I mean, but nobody's taking it seriously. And they walk around. If you ask the children here, you should ask the children, the teenagers, Perel, why aren't you wearing them? I'm not sick. So I don't need to protect myself so that it's protect you because I'm sick. Yeah, but what if the guy you go to get the juice at the juice bar is coughing in your face? Is he got it? And you don't have a mask. Touche. Too bad. You see, but this is what we have to look at. This is really important. It's not funny. You know, nobody really knows the truth of what's being reported, but we can't sit there and cry about it. We don't. You hear good things, you're going to hear good things, you're going to hear bad things about the vaccine. I can't tell you what to do. A lot of people are against vaccines. I've not taken a vaccine for flu and ever, and I'm 71. Not once. I'm not sure what I'll do, I'll be honest with you. I'm not sure what I'll do. But I thoroughly and completely think the ICAM protocol is really good. And I was really glad to hear that they were using it in Bandra. You know, I was really glad to hear the doctors are using that, which is very logical for a lot of people who don't take, we don't take a lot of medicine. A lot of the people who are here listening right now, we don't take a lot of medicine. And, you know, I listened to a friend, she was taking 12 different drugs and I, she says, what are you taking? I'm the same age as me, 12 different drugs. And I'm there like, well, I take a paracetamol if, I, if my legs are hurting really bad and I have a thyroid. So I take thyroid once a day, that's it. Anything else I use is a vitamin pill, that's all, you know? So, you have to stay strong. You have to have enough water. You have to have enough exercise. You've got to get enough sleep right now. You've got to. You have got to stay strong because if it hits you, it comes on pretty fast. And I heard it's 10 days, but I don't think so because some people here got it last week and they were saying they were exposed and it was very quick. So I'm not sure if it's changing or what, but the idea is to protect yourself and remember the world around you. This is why we said to you when you're doing your precepts, I will be loving and kind to myself, the earth and all beings. I said, I will be loving and kind to myself, the earth and all beings. It's real important to clean up right now. If you're in India, it's a, I'm not asking you to clean up India. Don't think I'm that foolish. I'm asking you to clean up your street where you live. That's all. And I'm asking everybody to clean up the street where they live or make sure there's a lot of pigs down there that are going to eat everything. <laughs> That's okay too. <laughs> okay. If the pigs are there, let them have it. It's okay. But I'm talking about sanitary conditions, going to the bathroom outside, things like that. Don't, don't be doing that right now. This is crazy. This is not a country road can type you, thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can you, can you repeat that phrase you just said? I'll be kind to, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I will be loving and kind to myself, the earth and all beings. That's the sixth precept that we instigated Beyond the five precepts, we said, we want you to say this every day, every day, maybe five times a day. I will be loving and kind to myself. I will eat right. I will sleep enough hours. I will drink enough water. I will get enough exercise. This is loving and kind to myself and to the earth. I won't throw my garbage all over the place for heaven's sakes, unless of course the cows are there and, and the pigs. <laughs> okay. If they're there for heaven's sakes, feed them. There's nothing wrong with it. You know, I'm not coming down on the cows. I love the cows, you know, 
But the whole thing is use common sense. So it's myself, the earth, and all beings. That means everybody around you. That means the, the it means the little boy next door who's going to be the um, <laughs> the military designer for explosives someday. He's putting off cherry bombs at about five a day now. And when we had Diwali, it was about 15 or 20 a day. I'm not sure if he figured out yet that if he puts the little firecracker in something that it'll explode. I'm not sure about that, but this is crazy. It's like in another world, he was, I don't know. <laughs> he was, and here he is, he's coming around again and he loves it. He loves to do it, you know? So you have to be happy. The most important thing is to be happy because the energy inside you feeds everybody around you. That's what you have to do, okay? So has anybody any, got any questions? Do you have any, uh, you know, do you, is there anybody who wants to tell me that they can't do this? I have a hand on there, what happened? You know, that they cannot do this. I don't know where the hand came from. Oh, there it is, okay. Because you can all do this. I know you can for a fact. If you have questions, you can always write me. I'm, I'm getting so, I go in there about twice a day now. I'm still writing a lot. We're working on the Nevermind game. We're almost finished with that one. We're going to be starting on the Anatta book. The Anatta book is fun. Waking up Anatta perspective. We're going to start using, doing that one. And then we're doing research, more research on the hindrances. We're going to start talking more about the hindrances. The reason I didn't do it today is like I said, because I, I needed to do this before Christmas happened. I promised a lot of people. So should we say our prayer? You're not gonna ask questions? Anybody got questions? <laughs> yeah, May? Uh, Sister Kim, I have a quick question. So um, the coming back to the document on hope, um, yeah. So that part on uh, when we hear a negative answer with a positive change in the bait completely. So what if the other person is kind of um, always in a kind of a negative spiral? So let's say we try to say something positive and then they will be temporarily positive for a sh very short while and then they will go back to the negative and they keep going back to the negative because generally they are a very negative person. Okay, I, I think I need to give you this, this little story, okay? Um, a friend of mine had a real heavy duty thing going with the family and the, the sister and her didn't get along and she was handling the, the, the accounts for the mother and she was very old and stuff and there was an issue about some things and uh, there was Mother's Day celebration and what happened was the um, the person who was taking care of the accounts for the family, okay? They came to the table and the other sister that she came uh, to the table and brought the mother, carried her to the restaurant for the meeting. And then uh, the other woman's uh, daughter was there. Now, she's really smart. She was beginning to practice with Bonte. And um, she was learning about this switch thing, rerouting. It's called rerouting the conversation. Now, see, the problem is if Ulysses and I, are, if Ulysses say is negative and he starts coming with a negative conversation, I can't just say something positive about the subject. I can't just stay in the subject. And if you, if you So what's left is, that's the second thing. Uh, the third one is reroute the conversation. So how do you reroute the conversation? Well, I say to Ulysses, tell me about the kids that were down there with your, uh, your family. And that's going to take him a week because there were a lot of kids in that family. <laughs> you know, but I'm going to say, well, what, what about the kids that are in the family? What are they all doing for the holiday for Christmas? And he's going to start telling me this big thing and he's going to keep going. And by the time he gives me the third or fourth sentence about this report about the kids and what was happening at the table with the mothers is this way. 
uh, the one daughter, the one sister wanted to make the other woman look really bad. And she knew she had to return something to her. The mother told her to return a credit card to her. So what the sister had done was cut up the credit card and put it in an envelope. And the mother was, uh, sus she was just, she didn't even know what was going on. She's sitting at the table for Mother's Day. And the sister, when she arrived, the mother sat down and the other sister took the credit card and poured it out on uh, the plate that was in front of the other woman. So really slick, the other woman picked up the plate and dumped it in her pocketbook and put the plate back on the table. The mother didn't even know what happened. <laughs> and, the, and the woman wasn't laughing or anything. And then because the sister was across from this woman, she said she was really looking ugly, like she was really gonna make trouble. So the first thing the woman did was she rerouted the whole thing. She said, so how are your kids? And they live up in Mass, you know, another state and far away. They live up in another state, New England, and she lives down in the south. And she she just went bonkers. She went, oh, let me tell you what happened to him in school. Let me tell you what my daughter did in in this. And her friend did this, and they went here. And then at the end, she forgot what what had actually we, she was getting mad about and she, the trouble she was going to make she just forgot because they served the meal she said and a couple times just a couple times this is interesting because the the woman who was the student she made a deal with her daughter and she said if i say anything that is negative and diving down like she is taking us i want you to say something to the conversation inject something and so first they had tried this with the daughter going like this or like that or like that and that meant three different subjects we need to talk about okay but this this time when they met the daughter injected the subject instead of saying this way or this way, giving the, the mother a signal, she just injected the subject. So by injecting the subject, change is something the other person really wants to talk about. And you know your friend has something she really wants to talk about. And it, whether it's her family, her house, her new curtains, whatever it is, and you get them to really explode in that direction, they won't go back to the negative. Okay, so they had lunch. And the mother got up, she went to the bathroom. And while she was going to the bath to the toilet before she came back to get ready to leave, and the sis the other the other sister was sitting there and just like tapping the table because and then suddenly she made the remark to the other woman and her daughter, I just can't believe this. I just hate you so much and I was going to be so ugly and angry and I just couldn't be angry because I was happy the whole time during this lunch. I was happy. And then she got up and left and took the mother and left. Do you see what happened? Do you see what happened? This woman was just cut off, cut off, but not in a bad way, not in her face. And like, you know, if I'm telling you a really bad down story and you were to try to mock the story, tell me it's not true or, or something, and I was really serious about it, it wouldn't work because that would cause an argument. See, if you stayed in and tried to compliment the subject I was talking about when she was going down, down, down with it, that wouldn't work either. The only successful way is to reroute it. So it's like this. Uh, she's throwing, the, the Buddha had a saying, how'd that go? Um, this is great. The man came to the Buddha once and got right in his face and said, who do you think you are saying you're the Buddha? Who do you think you are? You're just as dumb as us. You don't have any business telling everybody what the Buddha said. The Buddha said um, uh, he said, yeah, let me ask you a question. And the man said, yes. And he said, um, he said, you know, if, um, if you give, if, if someone gives you a gift and you don't keep it, you don't like it, you give it back to the person. Isn't that true? And he said, um, yeah, that's true. That's true. He said, well, you just gave me anger and I'm giving it back to you because it's yours. And he turned around and he walked away. <laughs> I don't want it. It's yours. It's your anger. You brought it. You tried to give it to me. I don't want it. So you take it home. <laughs> That's just it. That was his lesson.
whatever you put out, you're going to get back. But this was an interesting way to get back. The Buddha wasn't going to get mad at him in his face, right? He wasn't going to get mad at him. So what did he do? He gave it back to him. He explained why he's not upset. He wasn't going to give him a lecture about dependent origination and why he's in equanimity and how come he's calm. So what did he do? He gave him a lesson. Anytime you give something out like that, if the person is knowledgeable, they're going to give it right back to you and they're just going to leave because two people cannot have a war if one of them leaves. <laughs> it can't happen, can it? Isn't that true? They should have a standard international law, universal in every country on the globe. If an army approaches and they want to fight, one or the other of them has to leave. And there's no fight. It's the end of it. They've gone too far, the boys and their toys. <laughs> That's it, my favorite expression. What's wrong with the world, mommy? Why is it like this? It's not a problem. Why isn't it a problem? It's really upsetting me. It's upsetting the kids. I said, you have to just explain it to them this way. They went in the backyard, they played with their guns and their toys and their tanks and everything in the sandbox. And these men had grown up. Now you gave them real guns and real tanks and real things. What do you think was going to happen? And now they're playing with them. As if nobody's going to, nobody came out to the sandbox. Well, nobody's going to stop them. This is crazy. So basically, they're not smart. I don't mean to insult them. They're just big little boys with toys that actually work. You know, when I was in the peace movement years ago, we used to have these meetings and we had to write a story. And a friend of mine, the two of us wrote this little seat. I don't even know what happened to it. It was a little tiny, a little tiny scene that you did together on stage. But basically what it was about was one person was and they gone on. He was trying to let this country know that they were going to come blow them up and all this other stuff. And, and he says, no, you don't have to worry. Let's just go out to dinner. But, but it's a crisis. We have to talk. No, no, let's just go out to dinner. We'll go out to Howard Johnson's. We'll get ice cream and have a nice meal. It'll be nice. Why well, I can't go now. There's a crisis. Somebody's going to attack. Hey, don't worry about it. He said, what do you mean don't worry about it? Well, I see that telephone call was from the scientists that designed the missiles that put the put the warheads on top of the missiles and what they didn't tell anybody was that they could kidnap them they could force them to make them they could force them to build them dinner and the idea was we were trying to get across nobody really knows if they'd ever work anyway if you fired them and the joke was the scientists all got together as a secret society and they said, yeah, we'll come with your army or this country or that country, we'll build it. Well, guess what happened when they finally figured out they all agreed to make them, but they would never work, but they would never tell anybody they wouldn't work until they just didn't work. <laughs> and you know what? That play was neat because afterwards, a lot of us could sleep a lot better. We just went to sleep because we changed our mind. We didn't want to face the stress in children living in the nuclear age. And the kids thought it was a really good little play that we did because it was, it's not real, but it was a story. It was a good enough bedtime story to go to bed and sleep. In those days, the kids weren't sleeping, you see? But this took an edge off of everything, you see? Of course, we need more than that. We need more work, but we've come a long way, at least at the Pentagon. Now they don't talk about things in terms of bows and arrows and try to reason out why they're playing with these toys. You know, in the 60s, when you went to these places and talked to these big people about this, they would say, well, you see, it works like this. There's a castle and then we're going to have a siege. And it's just like when you shoot the arrows and the little balls hit the wall and break in. And no, it's not like that. You know, and they're like, what are you people talking about? It's not like that. I read the other day 
that the only thing that is the real tragedy is when evil men keep working and are the evil men the bad men or is the sad thing the man that never gets up and says stop we just have a problem right now because nobody's telling us exactly how to stand up and say stop that's the problem i don't know where it will go but i think we need to keep smiling about it because it really is a bunch of little boys in this sandbox and somebody at some point the school teacher is going to come home back to the school and say you have to come in and sit down at some point that's going to happen i don't know if that means there's going to be a woman president but it certainly isn't the one that's floating around right now that's not the right one <laughs> you know but you the whole thing is what you can do and what you can't do. And what you really can do is build your energy and put it out. And remember that I told you this is really true. When you're working with loving kindness, you need to understand the energy is going out from you like this and spreading around. And when you go out and smile, just smile and let things go. Just never mind. <laughs> never mind is coming quickly. It's, that book is on its way. Okay, so let's let's everybody finished. Anybody else have a comment? Yes, yes, Mataji. Ah, Boomer's got a comment. <laughs> yeah, uh, Mataji, what can you what can you tell me about choices awareness as a means of practice? <laughs> there is no object of meditation. It was an experiment that turned into a movement. Mm -hmm. And by not having an object of meditation, it was like where you take a person, you sit them down basically and close your eyes and relax. But it's just beyond teaching a person to let go and relax. There is no objective. So we don't talk about it much because it's pretty worthless when you're talking about the path and you're wanting to go down the path to Nibbana. Of course, what I'm interested in is what can help you here and now at home, at work, with your families and everything else. I'm looking for that. People who chose choiceless awareness, um, what do I know about that? Well, in California, that I know some people that did it and it's not, it's a whole different kind of teaching. It's a modern thing. It's nothing to do with the Buddha, nothing. Because you have to, how, learn if you want to learn how to go through and experience the path and experience the movement through the levels you have to understand how it all works you see that's the thing and this was an idea of let's sit down and be quiet and notice how even if we're sitting down and we're quiet this is how it started you notice that your mind still fires off thoughts and your brain keeps working. And it's not you making that happen, you see? There are so many different things, Umar, you and I could talk for a week and we could go through a hundred different things, you know, and discover a hundred different angles of coming to meditation. But this one's way out there and it's for, it's not bad if you wanna go home from work and sit and be quiet and let everything go and try to get empty, that's okay. But emptiness is not the answer. Not when you're talking about changing the personality of the person and their outlook, their perspective of life and changing their relationships and that sort of thing. You have to go further than that. You could feel so, less right. Yeah, because when I practice mindfulness, like mindfulness of the body or mindfulness of the breath in standing, walking, running, whatever it is, the attention automatically goes to the sense of awareness itself because I've, I've, I've practiced that for so long. It's quite natural to me than mindfulness because mindfulness sort of divides, splits up my attention two or three. And this is, this is what I find the easiest, even in sitting because uh, the mind will refuse to go after the breath or the feeling of metta. This, this is something that you and I can talk about a little bit more, okay, but not, not really in the class. But when you're, when you're dealing um, with this, it's good that you have all this awareness and everything. But the question is, 
in your life itself, how does it affect the way you live? How does it affect the interaction with other people, with family, with work, with everything? How does it, how does it help that? It can calm a person down, but my question is in this case, what was mindfulness? What was it? What is mindfulness? And why are we doing it and how is it working? So by our definition, mindfulness is the observation power. So you have meditation. And when we talk about it in the classical sense, the meditation is observing the movement of mind's attention in order to see clearly the four noble truths, the dependent origination and the um, three characteristics. And we understand how they all are intertwined and how it all works. So we're, under, we're attempting to understand the origination, the disappearance, the way that a person gets involved in what comes up with the phenomena, and then the danger of that, and then the escape from that. That's what we're trying to do. These five pieces that are in the uh, Majjhima Nikaya number 148, the Chichaka Sutra. If, in a nutshell, that's what we're trying to do. So now let's look at one more time, the origination of how do these things arise? How do they operate, come up? Then they, how do they disappear? And they, number one, they always disappear because of a Nietzsche, but how do they disappear? We don't make them disappear, they just disappear, okay? So that's the second one. Gratification meant how, do, how does it work in the function of this being that I just jump to something that arises and, and I get curious and then I look for what I like or dislike and I take off with craving it and clinging it and having a rejection of it or an embracing of it. And I'm far away from what I was doing over here when I started. How does that work? Okay, so that's what that one is about, the, the gratification part. The danger of it, if you want it in a nutshell, what's the danger of it? Then what the danger of the suffering was, it takes you away from the present time. And the most highly functional human being on the earth is the one whose mind is clear, except it's in the little car. When I, you know my picture of the little car? You know the little picture car? You know what yes, I'm talking about? Yes, okay. we had the talk. Okay, so the talk about the little car, birth and death and the little car, and however old you are, that's how far you are along the lifeline. You stay in the car. <laughs> it's like the kids, don't get out of the car. Stay in the car. Don't get lost. Stay in the present time. Because the real truth is the place the human being is completely alive with the clearest mind in the, re in the research for the neuroplasticity and all of it. Where is the clearest point when they're in the present time? You can play with this thing about the present moment, but that's crazy because the moment's going moment, 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 moment. <laughs> But the present time is the functional way to look at this, the, the uh, worthwhile objective functional way of looking at it that's worth it to you is what am I doing? And when I'm disturbed, can I let that go, relax, smile and come back and keep going? So what you're talking about is the practice itself. What I'm talking is about is the practice result, objective uh, objectivity of the result of the practice and the operational potential of it and the potential of learning to have that mind learning how it feels to be in the present time that clear mind if you can perfect that then you're opening the brain to its highest potential that for for activity and clarity and clearness and awareness all those pieces come together inside the car <laughs> and right, guys but, love this uh... You yeah. love to ride the car, and then the last piece, the la that the the thing you're you're losing is your what's happening to you is if you move to that every time you move to what comes up for any reason at all, you've left the present time. You got out of the car. You left the present time. See, right. So and that is what I yeah, Mataji. That is what I try to do to be aware of the fact that I'm aware. 24 seven, all day, every day, because uh, retreats are out of the question. So this is what I have at the moment. So, that's beautiful. Yeah, that's, beautiful. that's the only thing, but I wish I could have Metta and Brett too. 
But so well, this is what no I have. Reason, there's no reason that you can't do that mm -hmm. with meta. The problem with breath is the stationary capacity for breath and the, um, when I say stationary capacity for breath, see, I the way I think of it now, if a beginner comes in and they're not stable and I wanna teach them, there's nothing wrong with starting them with the breath for a few days, but I don't want them addicted to the breath because the breath has to do with the way they teach it is watching the, the nostril tip or the upper lip or the rise and fall of the abdomen. I don't want you addicted to anything. Yeah, that's I what want, they're teaching I want, us now. I want you. However, when we're talking metta, karuna, mudita, upeka, it's a whole different ball game because I want you to learn to practice the, the loving kindness and the uh, compassion and the um, appreciative joy or empathetic joy and the equanimity until the mind adopts it. I want that in the mind. Why, why do I want it? Because the whole journey of the teaching is to shift the human being from unwholesome states to wholesome states, okay? And to balance them in the present time and have them fully, completely aware and functional. So the brain has the highest potential for growth and to see how far it can go in the human being. All of us have stunted growth with our brains. That's our problem <laughs> in the world. We have a stunted growth. We grow older, but we get, we're so, we, we haven't learned the lesson of leaving the past behind and not comparing what's happening here to it's just like this all the time. We don't want to do that anymore. We're not, we're learning from what happened in the past. That's true. We don't want to do it again. That's true. We don't want to just say, oh, that's this. There you go, bang, and keep doing that. We want to leave the past behind that way. And then we want to leave the future out of this because it creates so much worry, stress, tension, it's unbelievable the amount of stuff that I'm dealing with right now with people, you know, with how much stress is coming across from these lockdowns. And they don't need it because they're so concerned every day of what's going to happen next to see it, you know, and um, our government just made a terrible mistake with what they just did. Handing a family, each person in the family $600, what does it mean? Not a lot if you've ever been to the United States. It's not even going to pay the mortgage. So it's, it's um, I don't know what that's about. <laughs> it was crazy. I saw it and I went, are you kidding me? One time they gave us $1,600. That's a little different. That's a couple months of the mortgage, maybe the car payment, the mortgage, a little bit of food and stuff like that. But when you start turn, talking in terms of, of below $1,000, I don't see why they would print all those checks. It costs too much money to print those checks and mail them to everybody. 350,000 people or million people are going to get uh, $600. <laughs> Last time, over, almost one third of it was never collected. We don't even know where that money went right now. That's a fascinating stuff, you know, this is crazy. But this, this thing about when you, you're working to move from unwholesome mind states to wholesome mind states, you're working for stability and equanimity so that you don't jump to what comes up in the um, uh, distractions or hindrances or barriers in front of you, okay? A barrier, what's a barrier? A barrier means you can't get through it to progress on the path when you're trying to practice, okay? It's really blocking you. That's time to go use forgiveness properly to let go, find the barrier and let the barrier fall out. And if you can let the barrier fall out, you should stay in the forgiveness only by itself, not doing any other practice when you're learning the forgiveness. Right now on, on the um, Dhamma Sukha list, there was a thing where David announced, there was an announcement where, you know, Bhante Chain revised the instructions. So I called him up and quizzed him yesterday. And, and, you know, so I could really understand what, what does this really mean? And they're saying, just when something comes up, just re forgive it, relax, forgive it, relax, forgive it, relax. Okay, okay. But um, I didn't have that problem with my students that I would go that far to just say, just do that. And they said, don't six R. Okay, in 
meta, we've are training you to six R everything, everything. And we're trying to get across to you that all the teaching the Buddha gave about hindrances is very clear when, when we're going through these different suttas one by one, you're gonna hear abandon them, relinquish them, release them, let them go, allow them, just ignore them, don't pay attention to them. And if you have careless attention, careless attention means you moved to the makes it so enlightenment will not arise. Under you cannot have that happen unless those enlightenment factors come up they can't just come up they're like this see they have to get just like that totally balanced so you can fall over into cessation they have to do that so what is it that makes it so an enlightenment factor will not arise the moment you start paying attention to hindrances or distractions, moving to them at all, you're stopping the enlightenment factor every time you do that. Just remember that. You're stopping it. It's right there. There's a big discussion about it in the Samyutta Nikaya on page 1597 or 95, 1595 or 1597 of the Samyutta Nikaya. It's right there. It's about six pages long. It goes through it seven times because there's seven enlightenment factors. So it goes through it seven times that why they won't come up and seven times why you can get to Nibbana and they can come up is because you're not going to use careless attention anymore. See? So that's a big one. Okay, that part. So in shifting you from unwholesome to the wholesome, and we're working towards getting you into the present time functionally in life. I'm attacking two things here. I'm not saying that Get into retreat is so important for round the clock and all the rest of it because you got to get to there. Well, I got news for you. If you try to just do that and you can't explain to me the foundation stuff back in my face, you, you haven't gone anywhere. Mm -mm. And it's not going to hold up. Even if you have a cessation, you go through and think you're soda pony, you won't be because you don't have enough of the information to let go of the atta and shift towards anatta, you see? You don't understand how to explain the atta perspective, anatta perspective. You're not clear about explaining the five aggregates and explaining what should be done with them. Let them go, leave them alone, you see? Don't get involved with them, you see? And the th three kinds of feelings. And you have to have enough of dependent origination. The seven links have to be going and operating all the time that you're watching it happen with the dog, the cat, the horse, the cow, the pig, everything. I can see it. I can walk down the street. We have baby pigs here. It's really fun. <laughs> and go down and see the baby pigs. I can see these little guys doing all this stuff and fighting and playing and the dogs and the cats. It's all in everyone in, in human beings as well. You can see how it's working in the arguments or disputes and how it arises, it happens and it goes away, you see? So the Buddha measured your success in his teaching. Did I ever tell you this, Umar? I don't know if you ever heard it or not. The modes of progress are located. The modes of progress are located inside uh, the Digna Nikaya. Okay, and it's real simple. If you have a painful meditation, painful in your back, you're sitting wrong, your legs, or you have pain going on, a painful sitting, and slow comprehension of the Dhamma is poor progress. Painful sitting, and good comprehension or quick comprehension of the Dhamma is still considered by the Buddha to be poor progress. That's a whopper because there's a lot of trainings around the world that say, oh, pain, sit in the pain, stay with it till you get to the end, all the rest of that. He didn't do that. He do it even in the Vipassana. 
he he did yeah but the buddha didn't do that and try to remember that vipassana means insight and it's one half of samatha which means serenity and try to remember that in the texts themselves you never find serenity by itself or insight by itself you only find serenity and insight serenity and insight serenity and insight we did research on this and that's what happened the only place there was one place where they explained serenity and there was a paragraph by itself talking about serenity and there was another place just talking about insight but all this stuff about you cannot get to nibbana unless you do by the path of insight there was no path of insight it was one half of a practice you see it was one half of the practice he taught it was devised into an independent practice in probably the 1950s 1950s or so it became very popular some to to talk about we pass in a movement starting you go back and track it in history you're yeah, going to get to a point Mahasi, Sayana, yeah. and all those people well Mahasi, but there was a little bit before Mahasi, but that's what you're going to bump into you're going to bump into this is what we're going to do see it's like slow walking where did slow walking come from nobody can tell us <laughs> like slow walking. There was no slow walking. Even Mahasi Sayadaw walked fast behind his kuti on a 40 foot strip, 35 or 40 feet long. He walked fast back and forth. It was only after he died, some of them decided, I got an idea, let's have a slow walking. We don't know where it came from. But you see, that's with the Westerners going to practice Mahasi, there was quite a lot of problems with legs and circulation and not enough exercise and all the kind of things, see? And so the Buddha was talking to you about keeping your body in shape and keeping your food proper and keeping your rest proper. He didn't talk about sleep depredation, but because big monks can stay up with only three or four hours of sleep, doesn't mean some woman should go and try and do that from Malaysia. She died, for heaven's sakes. She came back and she came into our retreat and didn't tell us she was coming out of a retreat where they had her down to four hours of sleep. It was she died? a tragedy. It was a tragedy. And she was push, 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 push. We told her how many hours of sleep she'd have seven and a half hours in our retreats, right? And what happened? That happened. Just a tragedy. We celebrated her death last year. We celebrated her one year. It was very, very sad. All because, you know, she didn't tell anybody what she was doing. She was just sitting like crazy. And we didn't know where she was coming from. And that's why we're so heavy duty about where have you just been? When was your last retreat? Where have you just been? And tell us exactly what was going on. Everything. We won't let you in if you come on a retreat five, six days later. We know what they did in Burma. And they they supported sleep depredation. And in in uh, the in the suttas, there's sections where he tells you all the different things. If you want to, we'll do that one some night. Tells you all the different things that failed. There's a couple of suttas in there where he talks to his monks. I did this and this is how far I went and this is what I did. And then it didn't, didn't result in anything that was considered noble, uh, noble um, progress, you see? And he, he laid it all out for them. In 128, he makes it as clear as he possibly can for 11 different hindrances that the solution to all of this is to realize these things that arise are imperfections and should be abandoned the imperfection and continue on, abandon the imperfection. You've got a whole bunch of them are in there. I give them to you in your, I've taught that sutta to you before usually, and I give you that whole list of 11 or 12, I think it's 11 of them. There's another place where there's 16 and the solution in that section is interesting uh, because the solution is to do the opposite. 
And that was the one we taught a couple of weeks ago where if the, the monk is having trouble sitting in the forest because he's afraid and fears arising. So he says, but when I went in there, I went into there with courage, without fear, and I sat just fine. So he's clear about these different emotional things that arise and he knows he can take the opposite to counter it like that. So it's like a scale. This is what happens, you know, and I need it to balance. And when I'm balanced, that's when I can sit the best seat. So I'm not saying choiceless awareness is a bad meditation. I'm just saying it's not anything to do with what we're doing. That's where I would put it, okay? Just like if somebody said, well, I've been practicing, um, you know, one point of concentration and I can go in absorption and do those jhanas and that's okay. If you're getting out of it what you want in life and your life is stable and you're, you're very kind and patient with people in, in life when you come out of your retreat and that's really improving your relationships with everybody everywhere, hey, that's okay. You want to do it, that's fine. If somebody's here just to get to Nibbana, I'm telling you, Bonji will get you there. If you do what he says, he'll get you there. I've gotten to the point, I'm more interested in stabilizing the community for their relationships in lockdown and relieving people of stress. And I don't want them to overstress getting to Nibbana. Getting to Nibbana is part of the journey, but that's not the whole point of relief. The relief was described as in 107, you're going to find him describing the teaching as a gradual teaching with gradual practice, with gradual progress. That meant progress. What is progress in this practice? It is more and more level, a higher level of relief a deeper ability to look inside, a better quality of equanimity that's more stable. That's what it is. And so that's what we need in life. I would like to feed people the best way to have the highest innovation and productivity in work that they can possibly have. I love to talk to this, some of the uh, you know, companies I talked to in Sri Lanka before. It was fun. When they measure in the office what happens after we talk about productivity and innovation and contribution to the project and the work teams they get on and stuff in engineering, their productivity goes up and their innovation starts to come in, their ideas and innovation because they're letting go of the past and future and they're staying in the car. And in the car is the most productive innovative lab in the universe <laughs> because there's no pressure in there. You have your own environment in this really neat little car. You've got the proper temperature, the proper seating, the proper support for your back. You can lay it down and go to sleep on the side of the road. Think about it. <laughs> so are we done? Okay. Okay. <laughs> uh, just write me a note and tell me when you are able to um, Maybe talk tomorrow. I wanted to talk to you about a couple of things, okay? Okay? okay. I hope. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. All right. Let's do let's do the closing. People come, you know, it's like I feel like I'm in Oz sometimes. You remember the Wizard of Oz? You remember when Ke when Dorothy was there? Remember the Wizard of Oz? And and Dorothy's there and she says, Oh. I just can't believe how people come and they go and they come and they go. And you're doing a Zoom class and they're coming and they're going and they're coming and they're going. This is like being in the Wizard of Oz. I'm in Oz. Okay, good. Here we go. May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation.